Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. As we begin to celebrate this Mass today, let us do so again by calling to mind our sins, remembering this great miracle that the Lord gives us daily when he's willing to forgive us our sins, when we are able to receive him body and blood into ourselves. And this is the daily miracle that we experience in our lives with Christ. And so as we celebrate this Mass again, let us call to mind our sins, remembering that we are not worthy of these graces, of these gifts, and asking God for his forgiveness. I confess to to Almighty God God, and to you, my brothers and sisters, sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever-Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. May your unfailing compassion, O Lord, cleanse and protect your church. And since without you she cannot stand secure, may she be always governed by your grace, through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the second book of Kings. Naaman, the army commander of the king of Aram, was highly esteemed and respected by his master, for through him the Lord had brought victory to Aram. But valiant as he was, the man was a leper. Now the Arameans had captured in a raid on the land of Israel a little girl who became the servant of Naaman's wife. If only my master would present himself to the prophet in Samaria, 
she said to her mistress, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went and told his lord just what the slave girl from the land of Israel had said. Go, the king of Aram said. I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman set out, taking along ten silver talents, six thousand gold pieces, and ten festal garments. To the king of Israel he brought the letter which read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When he read the letter, the king of Israel tore his garments and explained, Am I a god with power over life and death, that this man should send someone to me to be cured of leprosy? Take note, you can see he is only looking for a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his garments, he sent word to the king, Why have you torn your garments? Let him come to me and find out that there is a prophet in Israel. Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. The prophet sent him the message, Go and wash seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will heal, and you will be clean. But Naaman went away angry, saying, I thought that he would surely come out and stand there to invoke the Lord his God and would move his hand over the spot and thus cure the leprosy. Are not the rivers of Damascus, the Abana, and the par and the far par better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be cleansed? With this, he turned about in anger and left. But his servants came up and reasoned with him. My father, they said, if a prophet had told you to do something extraordinary, would you not have done it? All the more now, since he said to you, wash and be clean, should you do as he said? So Naaman went down and plunged into the Jordan seven times at the word of the man of God. His flesh became again like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. He returned with his whole retinue to the man of God. On his arrival, he stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A thirst is my soul for the living God. A thirst is my soul for the living God. As the hind longs for the running waters, so my soul longs for you, O God. A thirst is my soul for the living God. A thirst is my soul for God, the living God. When shall I go and behold the face of God? A thirst is my soul for the living God. Send forth your light and your fidelity, they shall lead me on and bring me to your holy mountain, to your dwelling place. A thirst is my soul for the living God. Then I will go into the altar of God, the God of my gladness and joy. Then will I give you thanks upon the harp, O God, my God. A thirst Listen is my soul for the, for the living God. God. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. I hope in the Lord, I trust in his word. With him there is kindness, and plenteous redemption. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. <clears throat> the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy God, from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Thank you, Lord. Jesus said to the people in the synagogue at Nazareth, Amen, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own native place. Indeed, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was closed for three and a half years, and a severe famine spread over the entire land. It was to none of these that Elijah was sent, but only to a widow in Zarephath, in the land of Sidon. Again, there were many lepers in Israel during the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was clean, cleansed, 
but only Naaman the Syrian. When the people in the synagogue heard this, they were all filled with fury. They rose up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town had been built, to hurl him down headlong. But he passed through the midst of them and went away. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. This passage um, from the book of Kings about Naaman is one which I have thought about probably more than most. It's one I've always loved because it is the perfect counterexample to all of our expectations. And I love that. God never bothers to fulfill our expectations. Think about uh, the story. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful story, where, which perfectly represents our human psychology. Um, Naaman goes, he's got leprosy, he goes, Elisha won't even come out and greet him. Leaves him standing at the door, just sends a message out to him. First of all, he's not taken seriously. We need that. We want that. We want people to, to give me their full attention and, and to, to recognize me and to, to be aware of me, to listen to me, to see my problem, to examine my wounds. We want to be taken seriously because that's important for us, that you respect me, which is, of course, stupid. But that's our human psychology. Especially in this case, he is going and appealing for help from a foreign god. Again, he wasn't Jewish. And so in going to Naaman, uh, in, in going to, um, to, to Elisha, he was, in a certain sense, being unfaithful to his own gods. And he goes before him and, and, and wants this help. And then he's told, go wash seven times. Again, he wasn't given the signs of the respect he deserved. He came with his chariots and his horses and, and his gifts of gold and silver and ten festal garments and wasn't given the respect he deserved. Because it's all about this, this human nature. We need to be treated humanly with the, this respect that, that I have earned. And Elisha didn't even bother to say hi. Go, go wash in the Jordan. And it wounded his pride. But more than just wounding his pride, it didn't fulfill the narrative. Let's be honest. Most things in life are, that are worth having are difficult. We expect them to be difficult. That's why a book like the, the Odyssey of Homer is one that somehow has caught uh, man's fascination for over 2,000 years because it's the story of the travails and trials of a man seeking his goals. And we expect that. We expect these great difficult things. And God so disappoints us. He doesn't live up to the narrative at all. He would, make a, he would make a terrible filmmaker. God is not good at, at, at the, the suspense, at the, the, the drama that we would expect. Think about the miracles of Jesus. He says to a man, stretch out your hand. He stretches out, it's healed. Well, come on, he could have built it up a little bit more. He could have, you know, done some, ma you know, we're expecting, we think of Hollywood, you know, with all the CGI and we expect this great miracle and seeing the lights swirl and thunderclaps or whatever it might be. Instead, Jesus says, stretch out your hand. He stretches out his hand, it's healed, it's done. He has no feeling for the drama. God's got plenty of feeling for drama, but just not worthless shows. Think about um, the moment we're going to be hearing this reading on the night of Easter, of when the people of Israel cross through the Red Sea. That's obviously God in high drama, as he has Moses part the seas, and he has a wall of water to the right and to the left, and they cross through on dry feet. And then it rushes forward and crushes the, the, the entire army of, of Egypt. God can do dramatic when he wants to. But the point is, is, God doesn't feel the need to entertain us. God doesn't feel the need to impress us. And that's something that's so important. God doesn't need to impress us. He doesn't care if you're impressed by him or not. He's already the creator of the entire universe and your savior. He doesn't need you to clap for him as well. And that's why so many of the great miracles that God does, he does in absolute hiddenness. In our daily lives. That's why I mentioned at the very beginning of Mass. We daily can receive this forgiveness of God. And we can daily receive Him in the Holy Eucharist. That is the greatest miracle. 
Okay, let's take that same, same narrative again now and, and, and do it in more of a Homerian kind of way. If someone were to say to you, okay, your sins are, are red like scarlet and you must be forgiven. And to be forgiven, the Lord demands of you. And then we begin to think about all the different things. Oh, yeah, okay, so what would be, yeah, if, you know, if God were really to demand something of man that, that he proves himself to be forgiven, we'd expect this whole odyssey. We'd expect to have to climb the, the highest mountain in Tibet and meet with some guru who's going to tell you some sentence which you could have gotten out of a fortune cookie. And that's going to change your life. And instead, all we have to do is go into any confessional and say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been however long since my last confession and these are my sins. God's not good at the dramatic. You should have a bit more drama in there. But that's the point. God doesn't care about the drama. Our lives are not theater. And our lives are not novellas to be filled with artificial drama and artificial problems. We've got enough difficulties as it is. And God would make this whole path smoother and easier, not more challenging, more difficult, more dramatic. And that's the same thing that I, I guess what always strikes me about this story about Naaman. He simply had to go and, be, and do what? Be obedient. The only thing he had to do to be saved was be obedient. God didn't tell Elisha what he was supposed to. I don't imagine. He told Elisha, have him wash seven times. I'm sure he just knew all he had to do was whatever Elisha would say. If Elisha had said, jump up and down on one foot for ten minutes long while spinning in a circle under a poplar tree, he would have been healed. Because it has nothing to do with anything we do. And that's the key. It's never about us. God's graces are never about the things that we do. We do not buy our salvation. We do not buy the graces of God. Think about what happens when someone we care about is deathly ill. So many people try to buy God's grace. They think that, okay, I've lived terribly until now, but because my dad is sick, now I'm going to do everything right. And I'm going to fast, and I'm going to scourge myself, and I'm going to make a pilgrimage on foot from here to Jerusalem. Whatever it might be. We think for ourselves, I'm going to make my own odyssey. I will take upon myself this great and terrible journey so that I may be granted. And that's not how God works. It's always His grace. It's always His gifts. And He can give it, stretch out your hand and be healed. That easily. Ego te absolvo. That simply your sins are forgiven. And that's the point. That we remember again, it's God's grace. It's not our actions. It's not us earning it, buying it, uh, being worthy of it. It's us being obedient to God. And so sometimes when I see people who are trying to force God's hand, the first thing I would say to them is go to confession, go to Mass. Go do an hour of adoration. Come to know your God. And then in your prayers you will recognize, is this the will of God that this child be healed? That I get this job? That I be given whatever grace it is that I think that I am going to earn for myself? And the next thing we realize is that it's never our reward. It's not like we've earned these graces. There is no earning the grace of God. God's grace is always a free gift of His love to us. Free, no strings attached. Often He waits. He often waits very long, sometimes years, before He gives us that grace. Because the whole point is, God wants us to grow and progress spiritually. Yes, so our prayers, our sacrifices absolutely have value. Absolutely. But never value in the sense of, I'm paying down the graces. If I were to say just, if I had said just one more Hail Mary, maybe my son would have been saved. That's garbage. That's not how it works. God's not a finance committee that you have to, you know, you're, you're paying interest on a loan or you're trying to prepay something that you've got on layaway. So once I get enough graces in there, then all of a sudden I've got this. That doesn't work that way. We need to learn to trust implicitly in God. And remember, everything is His gift to us. You never were worthy. You never will be worthy. 
No matter what travails you take upon yourself, no matter how much we think like, like Naaman, I expected him to come out and implore his God and wave his hand over the sores to do a show. That's not how God's going to do it. He can, but usually doesn't. So think about the most important moment in the entire history of humanity. What is the most important moment in the history of humanity? The resurrection. What kind of a show did God put on for the resurrection? No one was there. As far as we know. Who knows, maybe Our Lady happened to, to be there. It's not written anywhere that we would know. Maybe St. John wandered over. Actually, no, we would know that because he would have said, St. John would have written it, but I saw it. No one was there. For the greatest, most important moment in the entire history of humanity, God didn't even gather an audience. There was an audience there for the most scandalous moment in the entire history of humanity when we killed God. And that was pretty dramatic with the, the earthquake afterwards and the veil of the temple sundering apart. But the most important moment that ever took place in the history of humanity after creation itself, no one was a witness to. Because again, God doesn't care about the audience. He's not there for a show. He doesn't need our approval. He asks our faith. He asks us to trust Him. He asks us to simply blindly follow Him. And that's when we have to set aside our reason, just like, like Naaman, and simply be obedient. And then God's graces will be worked in us. Then we will see His miracles. Then we will receive that which we've yearned for for so long. But it's in that order. First we obey. First we do what God has asked of us. And then He will grant us His grace. Amen. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God the Father Almighty. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. May what we offer you, O Lord, in token of our service, be transformed by you into the sacrament of salvation, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For you will that our self-denial should give you thanks, humble our sinful pride, contribute to the feeding of the poor, and so help us imitate you in your kindness. And so we glorify you with countless angels, as with one voice of praise we acclaim. Holy, holy.
You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity. Together with Francis, our Pope, and Adair, you, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. taught us to call God our Father, and so we have the courage to pray. Our Father, who, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Father,
Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. <clears throat> Make communion in this your sacrament, we pray, O Lord. Bring with it purification and the unity that is your gift, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Mother, I am yours, now and forever. Through you and with you, I want to belong always and only to Jesus. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. The intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Saint Joseph, and all the angels and saints. May the Almighty and merciful God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mass is ended. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Seite 164, die Ernten. Mano